So good evening, uh, everyone in Saudi Arabia, and good morning, uh, Prof. Stanley Nelson. Uh, today our topic is TME, TMG treatment sequencing, and again, extend a very good welcome to Prof. Stanley. Uh, so Dr. Stanley, please start your presentation. Okay, well, good evening to everybody. Um, I'm Stan Nelson, and uh, I am a professor at the University of Las Vegas, Nevada, School of Dental Medicine. Uh, I've been in dental academics for over 40 years now. Um, have uh, had private practice and uh, TMJ specialty practice, both uh, privately and in a, a university setting, so I've had some experience. Um, what I'm here today for is to provide you with some, my thoughts anyway, on TM disorder treatment sequencing that would be appropriate for a general practitioner. So as my students know when, I, when they get to know me that I'm not uh, much of a cookbook kind of a professor. Uh, each individual case is its own uh, merit, but uh, this is probably about as close to a cookbook approach to managing TM disorders in a private practice as I, I, will, I will come. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so here we are, we're in sequential management, and we can break this down into four primary areas. Uh, the first is uh, provisional diagnosis. Um, I was taught with Ash and Ramford uh, in my early practice days that uh, diagnosis can be achieved between muscle and joint or both combination type diagnoses, but you're better off thinking about it as a provisional diagnosis, perhaps, that allows you to achieve symptom control uh, in a reversible sort of a format. And what that means is, is that if a reversible therapy is something that uh, you, can, you can try, you can do, it's non-invasive, uh, it can be re removed and there's no harm or little harm to the patient. So um, with a provisional diagnosis and symptom control, that gives you some information and some time really to get a, um, refine your diagnosis so as things become more and more apparent to you with time, uh, you get more data to conclude um, and refine your diagnosis than you can lead to other things. So as you can see here, I am a basic occlusionist by heart, that's my training. Um, I believe that occlusal contacts have influences on the temporal mandibular joint and can influence temporal mandibular disorders. But as you can see here, occlusal finalization in my mind is uh, probably the last thing in the sequence that I would do. So first is provisional diagnosis. Sim that allows you to achieve symptom control. That gives you time to refine your diagnosis and then you uh, consider occlusal finalization procedures if they're necessary. So a provisional diagnosis first off comes with a statement as to the chief complaint and I can't tell you how many patients that I've seen in the course of my career that have had fairly extensive treatments uh, with very, very little um, complaint uh, as the initiating factor. It's um, somebody uh, comes to the dentist office, they are diagnosed with a specific disorder and then end up with a lot of different therapies for it. And the basic uh, chief complaint really wasn't, uh, was, didn't justify some of the, the, the treatment modalities in my opinion. So what we're doing after we collect the chief complaint, uh, we need to establish the history. And this is very important as whether it's sudden onset or slow onset uh, has a, a lot to do with whether it's acute or chronic. Uh, obviously you're going to have to achieve a examination and then, of course, as a general dentist, our involvement with this uh, is to rule out the influence of caries, endodontic tooth pain, periodontal tooth pain, uh, erupting third molars, those types of things uh, that can contribute to a patient's temporal mandibular disorder and maybe could be either the primary cause of it or a secondary um, cause or a secondary effect of it. So that's our job. We need to make sure that we've ruled out any dental involvement that could be contributing to the, uh, to the, uh, the, the overall pain profile in the patient. Symptom control leads to reversible therapies. Okay, so almost without a doubt, uh, I will initiate and recommend palliative care. So if somebody comes to me that I suspect has a temporal mandibular disorder or 
um, a nondescript oral facial pain. I will look at their oral habits. I will probably limit chewing, especially if one of their chief complaints is uh, jaw pain with function. And this is really, really important. We limit the chewing for a specific period of time. Normally that's like two weeks. And that means that Mrs. Jones, we've got, a, you know, your, your jaws are, are painful. It hurts to chew. We need to soften your diet. Um, there are cookbooks, there are recipes that we can use to soften your diet. I do not want you chewing gum or, you know, fingernails or whatever for, for a specific period of time. Um, and we usually set that for a two-week period. And the reason that we do that very specifically for two weeks is that the patient at the end of that two weeks if they're still experiencing difficulties or whatever, still need to get back and start exercising and moving their jaws. Uh, I have seen patients in the course of my career, and maybe you have too, that uh, a doctor has told them to limit their chewing and only chew soft stuff, and two years later, that's still all they're doing. Um, that is not good because then we get uh, weakened, atrophied muscles, and so that's that's a, a negative effect. So the counter to that is to limit chewing uh, soft diet for a specific period of time and making sure that that patient understands that. We can limit excursive openings, such as when the patient is yawning or sneezing, and one of my favorite therapies for that is to uh, tell the patient to extend the tip of their tongue up into the top of their mouth or just behind their incisors and hold it there as they open or yawn or do whatever they have to do. That actually keeps the rotation, the opening movement to more rotation and kind of limits translation of the temporomandibular joint and uh, will help from uh, kind of re-exercising re an injury if you have something like that in, within the temporomandibular joint. And then I like hot and or cold therapy. My favorite usually is hot, moist heat, uh, cold therapy has its indications too, and we'll discuss this now. Um, symptom control uh, reversible also includes stabilization bite splint therapy. I've talked with the, your academy before and uh, about stabilization splint therapy, but uh, this is also something that can be considered reversible if it is used correctly. Uh, physiotherapy or home care therapy, I think, is something that we do quite a bit of. Um, stress counseling, uh, marriage counseling, those types of things can be recommended in pharmacotherapy. Um, some doctors use a lot of ther pharmacotherapy in their, in their practices. I really don't, um, as I'm mostly able to uh, handle these things with the, the uh, conservative uh, therapy, and I don't really get into a lot of pharmacotherapeutics. Basically, what we're considering is, is that those therapies that offer the best benefit for the decreased amount of risks are what we establish for the palliative care symptom control portion of our therapy. Not all occlusal appliances can be considered reversible. Uh, this is the type here for uh, to be a stabilization splint. It needs to cover all of the teeth in the arch that it's worn and have at least a contact area for all of the opposing tooth. I think you can see here that uh, this type of an appliance can lead to hypereruption of the anterior teeth uh, and intrusion of the posterior teeth. And if there's time at the end of this presentation, we'll actually review a case so that I can illustrate that a little better. Nor do we enter in or recommend things like uh, clusal adjustment, reconstruction, or orthodontics be initiated at the initial stages of the, of the process. Uh, temporal manipulator disorder is a multifactorial disease, and until we've sorted through exactly what factors need to be considered for the patient, uh, I generally do not make any promises regarding occlusal finalization in these early stages. So cold therapy, the indications are acute trauma within 24 to 48 hours. Patient has a motor vehicle accident or a sports injury, uh, we may initiate ice or cold therapy. Strains, bruises, contusions, and muscle spasms are all indications for uh, cold therapy um, utilization. The effects of cold include vasoconstriction, you get an analgesia, and you get a collagen elasticity is decreased. Uh, the vasoconstriction and analgesia are good things, but we have to be careful that we don't uh, 
fall to pain masking. In other words, we don't want the patient moving the, uh, the affected area for a period of time while healing is occurring. And with decreased pain, the patient may be enticed or uh, more liable to uh, increase their, their, their movement. So you have to be kind of warned with that, warn the patient about that. Uh, it's contraindicated in certain nerve or circulatory disorders and also in rheuma rheumatic conditions such as lupus or Raynaud's phenomenon. Uh, obviously, a patient with Raynaud's uh, could have an, an acute exacerbation of the Raynaud's with, with the cold uh, you know, on the extremity, so we have to be careful about that. An ice pack should be wrapped. You never use ice directly. No more than 30 minutes on and then off for the same period. So that's the initial recommendation for ice therapy. Wrap it, no more than 30 minutes on and then off for the same period. Again, this is for acute types of um, problems. This is something that I use quite often in an, at my academic practice. Um, patients will come into the school here. Uh, the student will come and get me. We have a patient with limitation and opening. It appears to be muscle cramping. Uh, rather than joint uh, locked condition, uh, I will oftentimes use the vapor coolant sprays to help uh, relax that muscle and to achieve a, a better range of motion. Uh, I also use it in cases where the patient has been locked open and we've had a disc uh, joint or an open lock situation. Um, Spraying down the, the, the closing muscles, such as the external the masseter muscle, is oftentimes helpful in trying to reposition the patient back and get them closed. So uh, I use this quite a bit. Um, this is how it's, it's, it's applied. It's, it's under pressure in the bottle and it kind of shoots out. It's more like endo ice and some of these other things. But the technique for the spray and stretch that I use is we protect the eyes, usually with a paper towel of some type. And then we spray the muscle from about two feet, 24 inches from origin to insertion for about four inches per second. And we don't really want to frost the skin. And then after that, we passively stretch the muscle for three or four times and then warm the area. So I'll have a warm, hot, moist compress uh, ready uh, to, to finish the, the therapy up. Um, this is a technique that was first described by Janet Travell, if you're interested in the history of this. But here we have the patient set up. I cover the, have the patient cover the eyes with the paper towel. And then with my other alternative hand, I'll, I'll uh, make sure that I'm not going to, you know, spray the material into the external auditory meatus. So I'll actually cover that. And then basically we'll start with sweeping strokes from the origin to the insertion at about four inches per second, spray and spray. And this is done in a pelting sort of a direction as we go down um, in that direction from origin to insertion as we go. And then we let the patient uh, relax just a little bit and then I try to passively stretch the, the, uh, the, the mandible in terms of opening. Um, once I get an achieved opening, then I go ahead and warm the area and we go from there. Moist heat therapy is something that I use quite frequently and I've actually found it to be very effective. Um, I've published a couple papers um, on moist heat therapy and, and uh, I'm, I'm convinced that it's helpful for patients. It's also something they can do quite ineffective or quite effectively uh, at home. Uh, for uh, little money, and uh, it's, a, it's a good therapy to use. I prefer moist heat over dry heat. I think I get a little penetration, a little better effect. I don't have any hard data on that, but uh, I do prefer a moist heat therapy. Um, indications are to control pain, uh, to control muscle activity, kind of relax things, and then also I use it before exercises if I'm going to re recommend patients have, have exercise. Moist heat therapy, the effects are analgesia. It vasodilates, so that's a good thing, and it's sedative. So the pain masking or the pain analgesia effects are, are a good thing. The vasodilatation is a good thing in that it helps kind of increase the circulation and remove some of the, the uh, muscle toxins that are creating the pain, I believe. And then it has a sedative effect as well. Again, there are contraindications, sensory or circulatory impairments. Thrombophlebitis is, an, is a contraindication or certainly a malignancy or malignancy in the area. How to apply heat. 
This is a commercially available thermophore. Uh, it's a petite. This actually is reported to draw moisture from the air so you don't have to specifically wet it. It plugs into a standard outlet and has this, um, what we call it, it's an on and off switch basically. It just continues to heat as long as that, that uh, switch is depressed and then it, can, it turns off when you let the switch up, kind of like a dead man switch on a locomotive. Uh, we apply heat for 20 minutes at your patient tolerance. So as hot as the patient can tolerate it without hurting themselves for 20 minutes, usually two or three times a day. I generally will recommend the first thing in the morning and just before bed that they give themselves this, this uh, hot, moist therapy. The reason that I like it first thing in the morning is when we look back at some of the, uh, the, 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 the dynamics of synovial fluid transfer in the joint, uh, if a patient is clenching their teeth and grinding their teeth at night, uh, synovial fluid tends to be expressed from the soft tissues, uh, making the joint less lubricated uh, in accordance with the weeping theory of uh, hydrodynamic synovial fluid transfer in the joint. So clenching the teeth uh, puts pressure on the soft tissues from the joint, much like putting pressure on a wet sponge on your counter, and so the fluid gets expressed. And so until that actually relaxes a little bit and we get the lubrication redistributed around in the joint, I think the moist heat kind of helps with that for the first thing in the morning. So 20 minutes at temperature tolerance, first thing in the morning before breakfast or anything else. And then I also like to apply it at night for 20 minutes just before they go to bed again for the um, sedative effect, the, the relaxation, the increase in circulation and perhaps um, removing some of the toxins in the muscles to, to, to you know, I hope in some ways that I'm reducing the amount of bruxism at night. I don't have hard data on that, but those two times do seem to work out pretty well in my, in my patient pool. So that's what we recommend. This is one of the papers that I published on this using uh, thermophore pack versus wet towels. Um, we used moist heat. I had 57 patients. They were evaluated at five and 12 days. They were evaluated with a questionnaire and a, a, a index using provocation, range of motion measurements, resistance testing, and muscle palpations. And basically what we found was is between the two groups, 31% required no further combined treatment. So that was actually pretty good. So with just moist heat, um, at least 31% of this patient population felt that they didn't require any further treatment. It was a little higher on the thermophore um, population, 41% than it was towel, but that was not significant. Um, what I found out later was kind of interesting with patients that uh, um, my staff was telling everybody uh, that was using the towels to go ahead and take the towel and wet it, wring it out, and put it in the microwave for about a minute, uh, depending on the power and the heat of the microwave. Um, that actually brought the towel up to a very therapeutic temperature. And so while I thought there might be a little difference between the thermophore, which has a, a maximum temperature of about 180 degrees, which is very, very hot actually, and patients could hurt themselves if they weren't careful with the, uh, you know, working the switch. But uh, I figured the towel would have a less uh, um, of an effect because it was a cooler temperature. But with the therapy recommended from the staff using the moist heat uh, and the microwave, um, there really wasn't much of a difference. And so now when I'm talking to a patient and we're discussing palliative care, um, I usually will recommend that the patient take a bath towel, wet it, wring it out so that it's not drippy wet, but it's just moist and then place it in the microwave, fold it up, place it in the microwave for about a minute, and then fold it up and put it on both sides of the face at the same time, so, and under the chin, to give themselves a good hot soak. Um, that seems to be quite effective for many of my patients. The use of TENS can also be considered, uh, if patients are aware of that, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation is found to be effective in controlling pain. Uh, certain types of it can also be helpful for relaxing muscles. Again, it's not curative, really. Uh, it is a manner of transferring and, and managing pain, uh, which is reversible, and I consider it to be um, on the palliative or uh, first-line types of uh, pain defense if you need it. Uh, 
Uh, you can get pretty specific with this. This is an electro actroscope. There are quite there are a lot of different types of tens, either low or high frequency, uh, and you can vary milliamps and microseconds with it. Uh, here we are working with some computerized jaw tracking in tens, which again I've seen some some very um, convincing results with using tens and that you know dramatic muscle relaxation relaxation in some patients. Uh, computerized jaw tracking is more for diagnosis, but the TENS can be therapeutic and uh, is useful. So um, I can recommend those to you. Uh, exercises are something that we use quite frequently. Um, this begins at patient tolerance, and then I also begin with moist heat. So as we look here, this one for clicking and also for um, a synergistic relaxation of the, the masseter muscle and the closing muscles. You can stabilize the mandible with the fist and then open against resistance provided by uh, the clenched fist held underneath the mandible. So you repeat that maybe five or six times as the patient grows to tolerate that. This is helpful in patients with reciprocal clicking and it's also helpful in patients that have the deep uh, masseter pain uh, in, in this area right in here uh, as it takes a relaxation of the masticatory muscles, the closing muscles, to work against resistance with the opening muscles. So um, that can be a useful exercise with patients, again, following moist heat, uh, and the patient builds up uh, their tolerance to using um, exercise in, in this fashion, repeating five or six times as the, as the patient builds up to it. Clenching exercise, especially for the patients that you think are having muscle atrophy, maybe they've been guarded or afraid to chew for, for a period of time. Um, these are things that can be done to help increase the muscle relaxation uh, besides like chewing gum or just going ahead and, and building up to chewing regular meals. But I will sometimes recommend a cotton roll and the patient places that over the posterior teeth and then they tightly clench their jaws for five seconds and relax. Uh, repeat five or six times uh, as, the, as the patient builds up to using the, uh, the, the exercise and builds up to, to that eventually. Resistance to closing, uh, in other words, limited opening can be uh, affected by stretching exercises, as you can see here. Resistance is provided by the thumb and the finger. So we put the thumb on the incisal edges of the maxillary teeth and the fingers braced on the lower and you can attempt to stretch the mandible opening. Um, with that, following moist heat, uh, do this for approximately 10 times and then relax and do this five or six times during the course of a day and hopefully you'll be able to achieve a, a, a stretching situation, uh, how perhaps useful when the uh, have patients that have had uh, chronic um, anterior displaced disc without reduction for a period of time, um, that can be helpful to help stretch the, the mandible. Also, tongue blades are useful for that, and you patient, uh, give the patient a stack of tongue blades, and uh, as they stack them one on one and get wider and wider, of course, they just use the end of the tongue blades and never place the, both tongue blades you know, through in horizontally, only between the incisors. Uh, so that if the jaw does get stuck or the muscle goes into spasm, you can remove the tongue blades easily. Um, those can be helpful too as, a, as an indicator for, for patients. So, you know, two or three tongue blades a week uh, in an attempt to stretch the mandible open as, as the patient it goes about their, their therapy. Now, this is bite splint therapy. And again, this is stabilization type splint therapy. So not all oral appliances are considered stabilization appliances. So this is probably one of the more aggressive cases of bruxism that I've ever seen. Um, this is a situation here where uh, the lower incisors have been through, you know, erosion and bruxism. This is a 33-year-old uh, female patient and uh, has an aggressive bruxing situation. But uh, a stabilization bite splint can be utilized to uh, establish the effects of a um, physiologically ideal occlusion, at least temporarily. So we can establish canine rise, we can establish stable CO contacts and CR contacts on the patient. 
uh, and assess the effects of it and uh, contribute to our, our overall diagnostic regimen, hopefully affect healing over time. And then you assess whether you need to finalize the occlusion later. So here is a uh, class three type individual with, uh, uh, with, so we've cantilevered the anterior segment here for contact uh, to allow a physiologically stable, ideal contact relationship for this person. Uh, you can see here how that goes. We've kind of cantilevered off to the front again to establish the effects of an ideal occlusion over time on the patient's overall pain symptoms. In this case, it was quite effective, and the patient just elected to uh, utilize the splint over time uh, and uh, control the bruxism with this appliance and went about their business quite well. Uh, here we have a combination case. Um, patient had complaints about the dentures and other things, so uh, we quit, uh, made a stabilization appliance to see if altering vertical dimension or changing jaw position might be helpful for this patient. So part of the overall diagnosis. Here's one on a denture, the same thing. This patient had a new denture placed and uh, was complaining of severe headaches afterwards. Upon further evaluation, it had nothing to do with the denture at all. She was having some aneurysm problems, so we, she got the appropriate diagnosis and treatment following that. And she had initially, initi had initially blamed the, uh, the, the headaches on her denture, so it was ineffective. Uh, here is the denture in place with the occlusal appliance in place again, uh, just to allow establishment to change the occlusion, try different contact patterns and see if it had any effect and made her more comfortable overall. Here is how you stabilize an appliance when you have unstable occlusion to begin with. Um, generally, we will fill in, so anywhere there are missing teeth, I will make a kind of a semi ridge lap panic out of the appliance. Uh, here is a situation with an exaggerated curve of speed. Um, in order to establish a good contact on the posterior tooth here, we will contact the distal buckle cusp in this area, and then if I have to, I can actually clear out the um, splint area here in protrusive to allow a stable and a interference-free movement into protrusive as the mandible moves forward. So little tricks that can be used uh, with a stabilization appliance that will allow you to establish at least uh, temporar uh, temporarily establish stability and the effects of an ideal occlusion. Here again, um, edentulous spot. Uh, I don't like to cantilever much more than maybe one tooth to the distal, so I probably would not try to make a saddle here and extend distally on this case. Um, unless it was absolutely essential. If there was a situation where I had to do something like that and establish contact, then perhaps the, you know, doing the appliance on the lower or in conjunction with an RPD might be a better choice. So here's the appliance in the mouth. Uh, again, temporarily assessing the effects of an ideal occlusion on our patients. Lower appliances, I use lower appliances if the patient has had a lower appliance previously. Um, I don't like the, um, I think that I get a better um, stabilization of the anterior teeth with a maxillary appliance. In severe class two cases or class three cases, uh, obviously that changes the condition. So the lower appliance may be uh, indicated in that situation and I'll use those more frequently in those types of patients. Uh, I prefer to use the upper in most of these instances, but here's an example of a lower and can absolutely be fabricated to the standards of a stabilization appliance. No problem. So after the patient has had a period of diagnosis refinement and the symptoms have been controlled, or if they haven't been controlled, then we make decisions based on that but let's assume that the patient has been controlled. Then we evaluate the results of our conservative therapy. We have a much better um, understanding of the effects of bruxism, um, the overlay of chronic pain if it's there, and the need for possible irreversible treatment or occlusal finalization. 
So part of bite splint therapy involves reading the appliance over time. And so as I tell my students that once they've delivered this piece of plastic, the fun only begins then because it's not the piece of plastic that really has the overall effect on the patient. It is what you do with the plastic afterwards. And in this situation here, you can read the clenching that's going on on this patient, as opposed to in this patient here, looking at the evaluation, you can see that, that uh, this patient is aggressively bruxing uh, laterally, eccentrically, and that you can see the, uh, the wear patterns on the appliances it's being built up. You know, if this comes back to you in the first week and there are deep notches worn in the appliance, then you've got some pretty aggressive bruxism going on. And if you've established ideal contacts on the appliance and the patient's still bruxing, um, your odds of controlling the bruxing through occlusal means are probably not very uh, likely. So this is the situation here that understanding that information before you go on and start making other changes to the dentition is going to be important to you. Occlusal finalization includes procedures like occlusal adjustment, occlusal reconstruction, orthodontic or orthognathic surgery. Selective adjustment of the dentition is recommended and can be performed quite effectively if you've established the, the need uh, and uh, if you think that it's going to be um, something that you need to do pre-restoratively or whatever. Um, occlusal reconstruction is something that can be recommended as well and is useful. Uh, again, following the palliative care and establishing a causality between uh, occlusion and whatever pain uh, condition the patient is, is showing. So having that established then uh, justifies the, the escalation to full reconstruction or occlusal adjustment uh, if it's indicated. So finalizing the occlusion has a lot to do with whether or not the patient is stable or not and what you can achieve in visualizing the end result. So that is something that is very specifically associated with this for my students. And uh, we will discuss those situations with mounted diagnostic casts or um, now computer modeling of, of uh, scans to, uh, to see where we're heading with the uh, you know, stabilization type, type uh, what we can achieve restoratively was for, to stabilize the occlusion, stabilize the patient. I will warn you that there are patients out there that uh, will come to you, and uh, in this case here, this patient had been, I think, reconstructed 13 times, and it came to me because she felt that I was gonna be able to help her with her problem. Um, there is a thing called phantom bite. Um, mon Ash called it monosymptomatic hypochondriacal psychosis. But you will meet patients that are going around and the occlusion has become such a factor in their minds that uh, they're probably not going to be satisfied by anything that I could achieve or help to achieve through either occlusal reconstruction or anything with uh, from dental therapies. So please be, in, you know, be aware that there are patients that are like this. Uh, that are out there and be careful with getting in um, too fast on a patient like this with therapies that are considered irreversible. Um, much better to find things like this out in reversible means when you can just say, well, okay, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to help you. Uh, and, uh, you know, the patient can go on their way. You haven't, uh, you haven't done anything to them which you have to finish up or, or, or leave them in a state where you have to finish them or go through them. This is a situation here of finalizing the occlusion, like with the therapy that I showed you, the uh, anterior positioning appliance with the posterior open bite situation. Um, these are cast restorations that can be achieved uh, to fill uh, posterior open bites or, and I'll show you a case here in a few minutes that uh, where one was done as a primary therapy and what the effects of that was over time. This is a progressive open bite following an orthognathic case. Um, the bite started relapsing, and so we uh, used a material that we could adjust because we weren't sure when the relapsing was actually going to be finished. So we did something temporarily in the case of uh, overlay type uh, bonded restorations, and uh, we got the patient by with the overlay bonded restorations for a period of time as, as things stabilized. And it kind of gives us time that uh, we can add to, subtract from, and uh, 
before we actually get into definitive finalization type of clients or procedures for this patient. So uh, with a little thought and a little planning, uh, you can still keep things um, with as many um, options in terms of finalizing as, as the patient goes without uh, actually removing or getting into reversible, irreversible type of uh, therapies. Okay, so that's pretty much this uh, cookbook approach to this. And what I would like to do now is to take a couple minutes and we'll review. Um, we will review a case here or two. So with your permission here, let's, let's look at a, at a case that tries to illustrate some of this. This is my case, um, J.A. And she's a 19-year-old with a chief complaint of pain and clicking in my right jaw. She has a history of mostly left pain to chewing, opening and playing a clarinet. Her jaw catches on the first awakening. Aspirin is helpful, which she takes PRN as she needs it. This condition has been present over two years. It's getting worse. And the patient denies a history of trauma <clears throat> or initiating factors. She has frequent headaches in the temporal area. The patient has a history of orthodontic treatment. She believes her bite is changing. The diagnosis and treatment for TMD previously, two years ago, she had appliance and counseling. Her therapy was somewhat helpful at first, but the appliance didn't fit well, and the patient knows she clenches her teeth. This is the clinical position, a clinical photo of uh, our patient. 19 years old, obvious anterior open bite. Um, other things to note are wear facets on the anterior teeth, indicating some type of uh, function um, as we go along. So we have a progressive open bite, it appears, posterior um, second premolar, first molar occlusion on the right. Same on the left. Again, indications of wear. Posterior teeth show some abrasion or maybe uh, some uh, attrition. Again, wear. Her maximum opening is 44 millimeters. She has a right click on opening. She has plus two tenderness to the left and right palpation of the masseter and lateral pterygoids. She has a plus two tenderness with opening, protrusive, and retrusive resistance tests. Um, so that's a, a moderate pain on both of those. And she has a styloid process elongation noted bilaterally on the Panorex. So here we have the Panorex. And the one thing that I'm absolutely uh, going to show you and to have you hopefully take away is the fact that you can see that in the Panorex, although this is just a screening type of a thing, any case that has an influence of a progressive anterior open bite, uh, one of the first things I want to rule out is any type of condylar degeneration. Uh, that can be idiopathic condylar uh, remodeling or resorption or rheumatoid factor or whatever, because um, that is one of the first signs of a rheumatoid or a degenerative process at the condyle is a progressive anterior opening on young, on young women. So we want to make sure that, uh, that that isn't the case, and that isn't the case here. So whatever open bite that we seem to be seeing in this case isn't due to a degenerative condylar condition, which is, which is good. You can see the elongated styloid here, um, which could be related to either Eagle syndrome or calcified, uh, calcified stylohyoid syndrome if it's not associated with a uh, tonsillectomy. Here is the mounted casts, and again, definitively, you can certainly see that there are wear facets on these anterior teeth that, that uh, have to be accounted for. There are also wear facets on the posterior teeth. Uh, so you can see that uh, whatever is happening with this 
person, this individual is happening over time and there does seem to be a progression of the, of the bite change. Again, definitely can see the relationship here of the, the wear patterns and then again, the anterior contact patterns. Mounted cast in centric relation. Uh, always mount in centric relation if you want to visualize the movement between centric relation and centric occlusion. And the reason we do that at this school is because you cannot retrude the, the mandible on an articulator once you've mounted it in centric occlusion. So, or maximum intercuspation. If you want to visualize the entire movement pattern, it has to be done from centric relation on the articulator. And you can see here that this is a accurate mounting based with what we found um, on our patient recording. Uh, and you can see the wear patterns actually looks like they're almost lock and key indicating bruxism at a time. But here we have a situation where the, the bite is progressing. Uh, similar situation here on the patient's left. Shimstock contact confirming uh, the relationship. This is at about 15 microns that uh, this particular shimstock works, uh, but that's how we, we confirm contacts on the cast and also on patients with shimstock. Um, again, noting wear facets, uh, establishing where we're, where we're going, and, and again, the, the uh, the location of where it sets here on the anterior teeth. So our occlusal analysis indicates an anterior open bite of between three and four millimeters. Uh, intercuspal stops on premolar two, molar one and molar two. Retrusa was painful to manipulation indicating a disc displacement. Bilateral non-working contact relationships and generalized attrition. So what is the diagnosis in this case? And what do you think the uh, contributing factors may be? Our provisional diagnosis at this point, again, provisional, uh, is a right disc displacement and myalgia secondary to bruxism. The treatment plan will be palliative care as we discussed. So limiting diet for a couple of weeks, moist heat therapy, a discussion about palliative care. And in this case, if you remember from our history, we also have clarinet playing, which could be a factor. And we're going to establish a stabilization bite splint. And the rationale is to improve occlusal stability by establishing a temporary ideal occlusion. And we are going to assess the clenching and bruxing disorder using this appliance. And we're gonna assess the progression of the open bite based on contact patterns with the appliance as we go along. Because if I establish an ideal occlusion, I can measure changes uh, even at the, the 15 micron level using Shimstock. So here's the appliance waxed up, full coverage maxillary stabilization appliance, uh, flat plane posterior. There's hardly any indication where the posterior teeth touch on this or the anterior teeth with a shallow anterior guidance that will help with the patient to disclude the posterior teeth and working in and protrusive. Again, so the appliance has to be as thick uh, to allow at least a layer of pink base plate wax or one or two millimeters at the thinnest area of the occlusion, which looks like here and perhaps here. Here is the excursion. Again, just a shallow anterior guidance uh, separates the back teeth by no more than one or two millimeters back here, balancing and then working. And here's the appliance in the mouth. Again, this has to be a little thicker in the front based on what our need was to establish ideal contact patterns and seal on the anterior teeth. In order to establish the criteria for stabilization splint, that's what we needed to accomplish. And there's the appliance adjusted and polished. So here's our results. One week we had reduced jaw catching and discomfort and CR manipulation was comfortable. At three weeks recall, we had no pain with the appliance in, intermittent jaw catching in the morning, soft right click to the TMJ, Palpation tenderness was zero and we had a 50 millimeter maximum opening. So that's improving, that's good. At 12 weeks, the patient reported no pain with nocturnal use of the splint. So she's basically just wearing this at night. The headaches were reduced 75% overall, according to our patient. 
She noticed intermittent jaw clicking and jaw catching, which doesn't, I kind of expected that with a uh, disc displacement. Maximum opening of 55 millimeters, so she's well within the range of normal now. Stable anterior contacts on the appliance, and the appliance demonstrates evidence for continued bruxism. So she's placed on six-month recall with the appliance as she goes along and things go along. Long-term plan with this, um, we have to assess. Uh, she could consider redoing orthodontics at this point. Um, we have to assess the reason for the progressive open bite. Uh, is that due to a tongue habit or tongue control, or is that due to her, her clarinet playing? Um, those are all things that need to be addressed long-term. Short-term, the, the case is managed. She's not cured. I don't ever really think that uh, you can cure these things with, uh, with this type of therapy. Uh, you can heal and you can reestablish normal function and the patient can get along with their, their life pretty well. So I think a fairly good result. How long will the patient wear the appliance? Well, as long as the bruxism and as long as the patient needs to. And so while I don't hope to affect a cure with an occlusal appliance in terms of bruxism, I may be able to establish and to help with the, the healing and to minimize the negative effects of bruxism over a long period of time. And so that's kind of my thought process with, with that. So that's the first case. And I would like to, in the closing minutes that we have here, present a second case for you to consider. This one will be a little shorter. But I would like to have you see this, and then we can you know, open up for discussion in the last few minutes. So this is TMD and SH. Now, this patient is a patient that was referred to me because uh, she wanted to try to wean off of the appliance that she was wearing. This is a patient in her early 60s, and she, uh, I think two years previously to where I had seen her, had been uh, given this bite raising appliances. Basically, she needed to, uh, to separate her teeth, the, the doctor told her, and that it needed to, uh, to raise her bite. So this is the appliance on the right side, and you can see the appliance on both sides. So this is a single cast unit, uh, overlay, onlay type of an appliance. And you can see the result of wearing this appliance over time. Um, this is the occlusion with the appliance in. This is the appliance out of the mouth. And this is the resulting occlusion uh, without the appliance. And uh, this is pretty typical of, of uh, patients that I see that, that wear appliances such as this uh, over, over a long period of time. So development of a posterior open bite. And now we've got the issues associated with, uh, you can almost see here, intrusion of these teeth, possibly. I don't know where they were when they started, but if I look at the curve of speed here and I look at the curve that's established here, this pretty much establishes the, I think that these teeth have, have intruded. We may have had some extrusion here of the anterior teeth. And so what is the, the management options for a patient like this once you get into the situation? Well, we can try a regular occlusal appliance. You can try selective hypereruption of the teeth. You can try to do a number of different things with it. This was six weeks later after we tried to selectively hypererupt the teeth, uh, making some headway on it, but still not, not acceptable in the situation. The problem that I have in this case is, is that we've got a, you know, obviously a deep impinging overbite that's resulted in this. So we've, we've uh, this kind of a situation is, is the iatrogenic and it's, and it's kind of sad um, to, to have this happen. But uh, again, full orthodontics uh, would, would be required for this patient and, uh, and uh, that would be the longer term solution of this, of course, or restorative dentistry. Okay, so that's pretty much my presentation for this evening. Um, uh, we have a question. If you could see the yeah, I'd be happy to entertain questions now. Yeah, so please, we can have the questions now. We have one already. Okay. Is that on the chat here? 
Yeah, yeah, on the chat. You can see okay. the Q and A at the right corner. You know? Okay. Do you get the uh, option answer okay. live in type answer? Yeah. Okay, thank you for the wonderful piece. My concern is how practical does TMJ prolotherapy work on patients with internal derangement and prolotherapy? You know, I'm not absolutely sure what you're referring to in terms of prolotherapy. Can you explain that to me? That's Dr. Kali Mohammed. Uh -huh. If you could type, yeah, Dr. Kalim, please uh, and, uh, let us know about prolotherapy. And he has I'm, asked I'm, about MPDS also, so if you could take it that one first. Well, the muscle pain dysfunction syndrome is moist heat, um, non steroidal anti inflammatories. Uh, those That still is a, for, for myofascial pain, is uh, uh, definitely a uh, uh, recommended for that, and stabilization splint therapy as well. Although, um, for a lot of those situations, you do want to make sure that you have to, uh, you know, include the, uh, the stress management and, and counseling into that. Okay, uh, injection therapy into the joint space. Well, we call that, um, we're using that in the United States in terms of arthrocentesis. And in my experience, uh, Dr. Mohammed, that arthrocentesis is helpful in the first few um, hours or days following an initial uh, disc displacement. Uh, in terms of chronic disc displacement, perhaps less so. Uh, if you can actually demonstrate effusion where you have an inflammation in the joint, then injection of, of steroids can be helpful as well. But again, um, that is something that uh, uh, is usually done right at the earlier stages. In this situation, in the patients that I showed, the, I didn't have the option of using uh, something like that because it was fairly acute uh, or because it was a chronic situation. Um, and so the, the, the palliative care and the stabilization appliances are, are, are things that I use uh, more often for that. Um, the use of uh, arthrocentesis in correcting the joint uh, displacements uh, in my opinion, again, is more useful along with manipulation perhaps uh, in early stages. So if I can catch it within 48 hours or so, um, after that, then it becomes less predictive uh, in, for me. And so I may initiate palliative care and stabilization appliance or reversible therapy first and see how that goes for a period of time and then add that to the arsenal as we go or uh, and in, in now in an acute case, as if uh, a lot of broccoli considerable. So the second question regarding bite splint therapy, should the material be made with hard or soft plastic or acrylic? That is a very, very good question. In order for an appliance to be a stabilization appliance, it needs to be made of, an of a material that is dimensionally and thermally stable. In other words, I don't want the appliance, the material the appliance is made out of to change configurations or to be, um, I guess, uh, non-rigid at mouth temperatures and that type of thing because I want it to stabilize the occlusion. Uh, I'm using a material now called clear, uh, clear guard acrylic that has a little resiliency to it, um, but, but not much. So to answer your question, if I'm using, um, I'm treating a, um, a teenager or somebody in mixed dentition and I, or I'm making an emergency appliance, I may make it out of a softer suck down type of material. But if I'm going to use it long term, uh, as any kind of therapeutic device, the material needs to be hard enough that I can polish it and, and read the occlusal contacts on the appliance surface and, and repolish as it goes along so I can establish the, the, the full therapy for the patient. Okay. Next question. Under which condition in our patient do we use computerized jaw tracking to be specific? Uh, we don't use computerized jaw tracking specifically in our dental school. Um, it is used in some institutions as a diagnostic therapy. 
Uh, it can be used, I think, in terms of retraining and dyskinesis to try to show the patient where they're, you know, not moving cord in a coordinated fashion. But as part of that, the, the TENS portion of it is more therapeutic, in my opinion, than the jaw tracking actually is. So I hope that that you that answers the question. Uh, if you're if you're retraining mandibular movement or trying to retrain mandibular movements, jaw tracking can be a nice biofeedback device in certain circumstances. Um, it's maybe a little bit uh, overdone, but it could be used. Um, the TENS, on the other hand, is something that in certain pain conditions, patients respond very favorably to it. And in my opinion, it's non-invasive and uh, can be reversible. And so I'm, I'm, I'm quite for it. So TENS can be useful if you have TENS available to you. Indications of an anterior repositioning appliance? Well, in my opinion, I don't use anterior repositioning appliances as a first line defense. If I can establish um, patient pain control um, by making maybe a, a thicker stabilization appliance as opposed to a thinner one or um, allowing a little more freedom and flat plane movement or a little less anterior guidance on a stabilization appliance, I will do that rather than go into anterior repositioning therapy. Uh, however, if a patient is not responding to, to conservative therapy and wishes to escalate, then that might be the next step, especially in the case of the, where you have a diagnosable anteriorly displaced disc with reduction. I hope that answers that. Uh, I think that's all the questions we have. Okay. Uh, Great. Thanks a lot, Professor Stanley. It has been a wonderful experience to have you with us. And uh, we will have you for a series of another lectures for in the second phase. Thanks okay. a lot. Uh, no, it's been a pleasure to have you. You're, you're very welcome. Thank you. And uh, I hope everybody has a nice evening. Sleep well and uh, be safe, okay? Talk to you later. Okay. <laughs> have a nice day. Though, for us too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.